I'm going to try my Ukrainian. Привет. Доброе утро. My family heralds from here many years ago. Uh, they left at the last great emigration back in the 1870s and 80s when things were pretty bad for a lot of people here because of oppressive government. And we all know that sunlight is the light of the clear a disinfectant that makes things better. So transparency is part of the theme of this talk. I'm extremely pleased to be here. Thank you for the Deputy Minister for European Integration for giving us a great startup, Brock Pierce, Mike, and everyone else, because this is a group of pioneers. All of you should pinch yourself, because you're here at the founding of a part of history which is going to look very different from the hundreds of years that went pri previously to this. And most of it is going to get a lot better. I want to go first backwards and talk a little bit about history and even a little bit about philosophy of why this is such a great movement to be part of, whether you're an entrepreneur, an investor, or just a consumer participant in the world that's going to get more transparent, more flexible, faster, cheaper, smarter, better. Here's the theme. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness through decentralization in a transparent society. Let's take the history of decentralization very quickly. We see that basically in the 19th century, capital started to become decentralized because prior to that, all capital was owned by the aristocracy through land. And in the 19th century, we started the bond market in London and Amsterdam and places like that. And it started to move capital between lower use to higher return markets. Uh, the Industrial Revolution that you think of, the railroad, the steam engine, all of that was powered by the movement of capital from agriculture to uh, the entrepreneurs of their day. And you are the entrepreneurs of today and tomorrow. In the 20th century, we saw communications really boom in decentralization through the telegraph, telephone, etc., TV, radio, and now, of course, information through the internet. And just to take one example, the MOOC, the multi-open operating courses that are uh, being or organized by universities, where instead of 50 students in a classroom, we can hit 150,000 across the internet and teach them computer science. Uh, many of these students could never afford or get into a Stanford University or Berkeley or Harvard, but from Ghana or Cameroon or Argentina, they can participate through the MOOCs. So education is spreading also rapidly. All this, you're getting the point, is diffusion. Diffusion of capital, diffusion of communication, diffusion and transparency of information. United States founding, for those of you who recognize this picture of George Washington, the founding fathers, um, they created something very important because they were afraid of centralization. They had come from Europe where they were faced by, by monarchies that controlled politics, controlled religion, controlled information, controlled speech, and controlled thought and capital, and they wanted something different. So they divided something that was decentralized. The United States, and I think a lot of countries have adopted this kind of a system, not to say that it's the perfect system, but it basically says that large government, small citizen. Small government, large citizen. So they tried to divide the government into three or four blocks. Legislative, separate from executive, separate from judicial, each independent with their own sources of power from the Constitution, and then several layers, both federal and then balanced against state and balanced against uh, city or municipality. Each had their own powers and they would guard it jealously. If it ever got too centralized, too oligarchic, too controlling, it was bad for society. So they try and prevent that. Transparency, let's add that here. From a sort of a religious or moral philosophical point of view, in the old days, ancient Greece, for example, the Delphi, the oracle at Delphi, or the ancient Egyptian Greek uh, or Egyptian um, mystery gods, everything was whimsical and subject to the whims of the gods. We didn't have a choice or agency as humans. We were just fate. Uh, and the gods controlled everything from lightning to if we could have babies. Next, in Renaissance times, there was the concept in Latin called imitatio dei, following God's ways. And that was driven mainly by the Judeo-Christian Muslim traditions of the Bible or the Quran, following in the footsteps of Jesus or Moses or Muhammad and be a good person. In the Enlightenment, we saw a more moving toward more, rather than just pure faith, but also rationality. Aristotelian things came in and we have God is a rational actor in an ordered world. And today, we would say, whether it's the United Nations or something, we have more universal norms that are agreed upon by treaty across many, many countries. And so we have universal principles of human rights. And finally, in the information, in ancient times, again, it was all centralized, controlled by the elites, the priest, the shaman, the ruler, the king, uh, who represented God. And in Renaissance, the printing press was invented, and the Bible was the first book translated. 
Interestingly, because Europe was decentralized, lots of little city-states that were fighting for control, they let that spread. But the big Ottoman Empire in the Middle East and the Chinese Empire in the East were very centralized and they controlled everything and they didn't want people to be empowered. So they stopped the printing press, they stopped a lot of innovation, and those countries and those empires stagnated while Europe developed and became the dominant force in developing uh, technology and the Enlightenment. In the Enlightenment, again, further decentralization of information with the public spread of universities and education. Everyone became literate. And today, with the internet, even more so, open YouTube. I see entrepreneurs coming to me uh, in our venture capital firm in San Francisco or our office in New York or Tel Aviv. And people have not necessarily an MBA, but they've learned a lot of entrepreneurship on YouTube from watching other entrepreneurs and meeting at conferences like this. So what you're doing here is you're educating yourselves. That's great. It's another example of transparency. Then finally, on rule of law. Again, in ancient times, it was very idiosyncratic. It depended on the ruler of the state. They could enforce everything by power of arms. Uh, today, it's, it, it slowly, it's moved. In re Renaissance times, there were two sources of law, religious law, administered by the religious authorities, and the small states of Europe were the secular law. Finally, in the Enlightenment, in the 19th century, 18th century, we got rule of nations. And today, international norms like the GATT, the World Trade Organization, things of that nature, um, have made countries as disparate as Ukraine and China, Argentina, Cameroon, United States, all trade under certain similar uh, sets of rules and law with um, just us that can serve corporations and individuals alike. It's not always perfect, there's corruption, etc., and that's a problem. Now let's go to these things. We see that it's all good for society. If we go back to the year zero, approximately the time of Jesus, who was a kind of a middle-class person, he was a carpenter by tradition, Carpenter's, you know, average middle-class person, in inflation-adjusted dollars in year zero would have made about $500 a year. Move up to 1800, that person would have made about $615 a year because all growth was controlled by agricultural productivity, 0.1% a year. There was almost no innovation because all member information was controlled, power was controlled, religion was controlled, everything was centralized. The radical decentralization led by the bond market and capitalism in the, 18, in the 19th century, 1800 around London, um, through families like the Rothschilds who created the bond market, spread this capital around and entrepreneurs started taking it and developing new technologies that could benefit everyone and make a profit at the same time. It is a driver of productivity after all. But notice what happened between 1800 and 1975, went to about three times higher, $2,000 per capita. But today, it's in just 25 years or 35 years, from 1975 till now, it's gone up to over, actually, this is old, it's now $10,000 per year, GDP per capita. That's the information economy. And think about it, it's the power of replication. If you take one book and read it here, but then I put it on the internet and a million people can read it, think how much more productivity is being spread around the world. So first it was capital, then it was technology and communications, and now it's information that is really causing this exponential curve of growth that benefits hundreds and millions and billions of people uh, today. Following, same thing with technology. We're on an accelerating curve. It's a good thing. We're moving forward with great robustness. And you folks, again, you are pioneers. How many, let's see, head show fans, how many of you are entrepreneurs building new projects? Okay, a good third half of you. How many investors? You, okay, wonderful. So we got a little bit of a match. Notice they seem to sit over here in this corner, so run over here after the show. Uh, and the rest of you are lawyers, day traders, I don't know, okay. Um, let's go on, um, basically corruption. We were talking about transparency and decentralization. This is the dark under underside. And here we are in the Ukraine, where yesterday we were uh, shown a beautiful monstrosity. A, a, a building that, and a complex that cost something like two billion dollars, paid for by money essentially stolen from the Ukrainian people by uh, the former ruler. Um, and that's the kind of thing we've had bad guys, I'm not saying it's anything Ukrainian, we've had that in every society through every epoch of time. It's human nature is quite uh, persistent even though technology changes. So there is this power and greed uh, on the part of most individuals. We have to restrain ourselves somehow or the other. And rule of law and transparency help defeat it. It's really a good thing. If you know if you're being watched, it's not as easy to commit the crime. So uh, the World Bank estimated about 15 years ago that 3% of world income is taken away by corruption. 
that's like a year of growth. That can really help things. So if we can reduce corruption by transparency through things like the blockchain, it makes it a lot better for most people on Earth. So if we take all these things together, the decentralization and transparency across capital, communications and information, we come to a wonderful embodiment, which is essentially the blockchain, cryptocurrencies, the business that you all are in and help building the future, as we've heard from other talks today. What do we strive for going forward? I think there are a few things. One, decentralization is generally a good thing. There may be some examples in life where centralization is useful, but like standards of measure, current, uh, you know, degrees Celsius, Fahrenheit, metric, et cetera, centralization of things like that might be good. But generally, decentralization is probably a better way for most choices. Checks and balances, again, power for government should be kept minimal to m at least my point of view. We've got to promote you. We've got to promote entrepreneurship. And there are new models. The guys at Science have a beautiful model that they're going to bring an ICO to the world of venture capital. I embrace that as a traditional venture capitalist. I think we'll be embracing the ICO world as well and probably opening a new special purpose vehicle to, to meet this kind of investment need. The world has to change. We have to change with it. And you are pushing us to the change, or I'd say pulling us to the change by your great ideas and your entrepreneurship. Next, promote an even playing field. Uh, something that I kind of discovered after doing a lot of a fintech investments is that the power of technology has been such that what was once reserved for the wealthy can now be made available to everybody else. In fact, a great historian, I think it may have been Neil Ferguson or someone else, said that you know, in the lives of the ancient days, people like Cleopatra or King Caesar, Caesar the Tsar, uh, the, the, the ruler of Rome, or Queen Elizabeth, they lived w well, they lived very, very well. And people today, the billionaires of today, live well too, sort of similar. Their lives have not changed that much. What has really changed is that most people in society in ancient days were serfs, peasants, and slaves. And most people today are middle class. That is the real revolution. The rich have always lived well. The big change that society, democracy, transparency has brought is that everybody else, or at least most people, can move up. And I think our jobs as moral beings is to help that poor poverty stricken people, through no fault of their own, can also move up within our lifetime and so that everyone can send their kids to school, take a vacation, have good health care, pay for their lives and retire in peace. Um, so foster social mobility, that's how we do it, through education, through rule of law, through transparency. And we'll incentivize transparency and minimize corruption that way. And I was just thinking, I think that's basically the end, I want to just summarize with a feeling that I got when I came flying here. I was flying from Tokyo to, through Poland to um, Ukraine. And I noticed that the color that first struck me at the Polish airport in Warsaw when I landed was orange. There's orange everywhere. And then I remembered that the revolution here, the color of the revolution in Ukraine was orange. And through Georgia and many of the countries that were trying to liberate themselves from the, the former Soviets was orange. Now, how does orange come about in the color circle? We have red plus yellow. How do we get that? Well, red can symbolize the oppression that this country faced under the Soviets for 100 years, under the Nazis for a brief, dreadful period of a few years of World War II, genocide, Holocaust, etc., etc. The people here in the Ukraine have suffered it and know it well. Red symbolizes that horrific centralization, all-knowing, all-powerful power to crush the human spirit. On the other hand, the sun, the yellow of your Ukrainian flag, represents transparency, sunlight, the perfect disinfectant, the universal opener uh, and creator of life, the power of the life of the sun. If we take red and yellow and we mix them together, we get orange. So I wish you a transparent life in dignity, hope, justice, peace, and a lot of technological prosperity driven by blockchain. Thank you.